Lattice enthalpies tell us the strength of ionic bonding. The higher the value of the lattice enthalpy, the stronger the ionic bonding. For this reason, it can be useful to measure the lattice enthalpy for an ionic compound. The lattice enthalpy is usually defined as the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid ionic lattice is formed from its constituent ions in the gas phase. This can't be measured directly, as it's not feasible to form a cationic gas separately from an anionic gas and then bring them together to measure the change in heat energy as they form an ionic solid. Instead, we can calculate the lattice enthalpy indirectly using a Born-Harbor cycle. A Born-Harbor cycle is essentially a larger version of a Hess cycle, and, just like a Hess cycle, it relies on Hess's law. Hess's law states that the enthalpy change during a chemical change is independent of the steps taken. In other words, as long as you start at the same reactants and end at the same products, it makes no difference how you get there and what intermediates you go by, the overall enthalpy change will be the same. In order to be able to use born harbor cycles, you'll need to first understand what an enthalpy change is, as well as the definitions for all the different types of enthalpy change. Check out my videos on enthalpy changes if you'd like a refresher with this. I'll have links in the description below. The reason that born harbor cycles work is because there are two different enthalpy changes that both describe the formation of one mole of an ionic solid. Let's look at sodium chloride as an example. The enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a compound is formed from its constituent elements in their standard states. The lattice formation enthalpy is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a solid ionic lattice is formed from its constituent ions in the gas phase. We can see that both of these reactions lead to the formation of one mole of sodium chloride. So, we can start setting up our born harbor cycle like this. Now, if we could connect these two energy levels using various other enthalpy changes, we'd effectively have a big Hess cycle which we can solve to find the missing lattice enthalpy. The way we do this is to think which enthalpy changes will convert the constituent elements in their standard states into the gaseous ions. The first thing we'll need to do is convert our elements into gaseous atoms. From here, we can convert them into gaseous ions. So we can start by converting the solid sodium into gaseous sodium atoms. This is the process described by the enthalpy of atomization for sodium. We can also convert the chlorine molecules into individual chlorine atoms. This is the process described by the enthalpy of atomization for chlorine. Now we have gaseous atoms, but we'll need to convert them into gaseous ions. We can remove electrons from the sodium atoms to form sodium ions in a process described by the first ionization energy of sodium. The final step is to convert the chlorine atoms into chloride ions. This process is described by the first electron affinity for chlorine. Okay, so now we have a complete born harbor cycle. Arrows pointing upwards represent endothermic enthalpy changes, and arrows pointing downwards represent exothermic enthalpy changes. We'll now need to assign values to each of these arrows using given values of enthalpy changes. Once this is done, we can work out the missing lattice enthalpy. The easiest way to solve this born harbor cycle to find the lattice enthalpy is to use the same method that I demonstrated in my Hess cycle video. Remember, Hess's law tells us that as long as you start in the same place and end in the same place, the overall enthalpy change will be the same. So, I want to look for two roots that start in the same place and end in the same place and that follow the arrows around my born harbor cycle. If I start at the elements in their standard states and follow the directions of the arrows, one route will go from here directly to solid sodium chloride. The other route goes all the way around the rest of the born harbor cycle and ends up at the same place. According to Hess's law, since these two routes start and end in the same place as each other, the overall enthalpy change for each route will be the same. And, because I'm following the directions of the arrows in both routes, I can just use the values of the enthalpy changes as they're written, 
no need to change any of the signs at all. So the enthalpy of formation for sodium chloride will be equal to the sum of all of these other enthalpy changes. With just a bit of rearranging, I can find the lattice enthalpy of sodium chloride. Let me show you another example. This is the born harbor cycle for calcium oxide. It's set up in the same way as the sodium chloride one. Notice that there are two ionization energies for calcium, because it needs to lose two electrons when becoming calcium 2 plus. And there are two electron affinities for oxygen, because it needs to gain two electrons when becoming oxygen 2 minus. Remember that the first electron affinity is always exothermic because you're forming an attractive force between the incoming electron and the positively charged nucleus of the atom. The second electron affinity is always endothermic, because it requires energy to push another negatively charged electron onto a negatively charged ion, since they repel each other. Once the born harbor cycle is set up, I can assign values to the arrows using given enthalpy changes. Now, just like before, I need to find two routes which both follow the direction of the arrows. Again, these routes will start at the elements in their standard states and finish at solid calcium oxide. Thanks to Hess's law, I can equate these two routes and rearrange the equation to find the lattice enthalpy. Let's take a look at one last example, which is slightly trickier than the others, and is the type of born harbor cycle where people usually make mistakes. This is the born harbor cycle for magnesium bromide. By now, you should hopefully understand how this was set up. Using given values of enthalpy changes, I can assign values to the arrows. Now, there are a couple of things I want to point out at this stage. You might notice that the enthalpy of atomization for bromine has been doubled here. This is because the definition of the enthalpy of atomization is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms is formed from a substance in its standard state. However, here, there are not one but two moles of gaseous bromine atoms forming, so we'll need to double the given value of the enthalpy of atomization for bromine. Similarly, the first electron affinity for bromine has also been doubled. This is because the definition of the first electron affinity is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms each gains an electron to form one mole of gaseous ions, each with a 1 minus charge. But here, there are two moles of gaseous bromide ions forming, so we'll need to double the given value of the first electron affinity for bromine. This is why it's really important to know the definitions of the enthalpy changes. They are extremely specific, so when it comes to using them in calculations, we need to know exactly which value to use. Once all of those values are in place, we just need to find our two roots. Just as always, by following our arrows, we can see that the enthalpy of formation is equal to all of these other values. With a bit of rearranging, I can calculate the lattice enthalpy for magnesium bromide. So, as long as we take care to set up the values in our born harbor cycle correctly, finding the missing enthalpy change doesn't need to be too complicated. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to support the channel and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.